This is Pastor Matt at North Plinko Baptist Church. We want to thank you so much for tuning in to this week's episode of Not Another Revelation Podcast. We hope you guys enjoy. All right, so welcome to uh, Not Another Revelations Podcast, and today we're going to be looking at Revelation chapter 6, uh, and wow, it gets real. Yeah, um, it does. Uh, we've talked about kind of this, this kind of... Um, this kind of pattern that maybe more some of these visions go in a little bit, not that there's much of a pattern to it, but, and you kind of see this as it goes on into chapter seven and in, even into eight, um, is a lot of, there's a lot of good and then it gets a little bad and then there might be a hint of good again. And then it gets real bad all of a sudden again. Uh, and you kind of get through that, those first, these first few chapters as we see these seals and then you get in chapter seven, some cool things happen and you get to chapter eight and it continues to get a little bad. Um, but this is where it starts getting, like you said, really real, uh, here in chapter six. So what we've got going on is remember from last week the uh, there's a scroll and on that scroll are seven seals and so these are are literally in your mind if you picture a scroll you can picture uh, you know wax seal on them where it's it has the signet ring of the um, the authority that is saying that this is a legitimate document that seal that scroll so that you can't open it unless the seals are broken. And so uh, obviously this is super symbolic The the we established last week, I hope that the scroll is the title deed to the to humanity and earth and human history and, and human existence. And so those seals being broken is going to unleash uh, God's wrath. We are going to see uh, what the in the Old Testament is referred to the day of the Lord. It is uh, something that is talked about by prophets throughout the Old Testament and New Testament. And the day of the Lord is never presented as uh, something to look forward to. Yeah, it's not something that brings a whole lot of, uh, of happiness and or joy. We've seen a lot of that so far through these early chapters of Revelation. But this is where you get into where there is not, there's not... Um, it, it, like, as you said, there's a lot of wrath, a lot of judgment, and uh, and, and things start to get, uh, things start to, to go down. Well, and we talked, I think, on the first week about one of the standard apologetics against Christianity is why does God allow good things to happen or bad things to happen to good people? Every time I've heard you try to intro that, you say, you I know, say I always it the other it way around. Um, so... I, and I think that the, the the short answer to that is is realistically there are no good people. Yeah, like and I remember you said this the very first week is that if if that's the standard we want, if that's what we're requesting, well, and usually we're not going to think about this. We're in that that whole bad category. Yeah, we're in that. We're we're in in the bad. Uh, God says through uh, David, our ways are not his ways, neither are, 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 are our thoughts his thoughts. His ways are higher than the heavens above the earth. And we think, oftentimes we think when we're at our best, you know, that we're, we're, not, we're not to God's level, but we're, we're, we're getting close. Yeah, I mean, I'm not that bad. And so what, what David lays out is, is that we're so far away from God that we're as far as the earth is from the nearest star, which is really far away. Uh, so we're, we're not even in the same ballpark. And so what we're going to see here is that the age of grace that God is withholding and holding back his wrath so that there's a time for mankind to repent and turn to God uh, is now ending. The day of the Lord means that those seals are getting popped. And Isaiah describes this as draw near, O nations, in Isaiah 34, 1 through 4. Draw near, O nations, to hear and give attention, O peoples. Let the earth hear and all that fills it, the world and all that comes from it. For the Lord is enraged against all the nations and furious against all their host. He has devoted them to destruction. He has given them over for slaughter. Their slain shall be cast out, and the stench of their corpse shall rise. The mountains shall flow with their blood, and all the host of the heavens shall rot away, and the skies roll up like a scroll. All their hosts shall fall as leaves fall from the vine like leaves falling from the fig tree. We don't want God's judgment. We don't want God to be just. And so when we say... Well, it's just not fair because if God dealt with, uh, if God doesn't deal with wicked men, then he's powerless. We don't want him to deal with wicked men because we don't want justice for ourselves. Yeah, we're wicked in everything that we do and, and in our, and in our, 
all attempts to be good, you know, I said this last week, it's one of our, uh, in our Galatians study, that everything that we try to do that is quote unquote good works or good deeds are nothing but filthy rags. And, and so like even in our best attempts to do the right thing and to do good, it's still dirty, nasty, and filthy because that's er- everything within us is exactly that, dirty, nasty, and filthy. So if we want justice, if we want, if we want, if we want God's justice to rain down, man, we really usually don't know how much we're, we're biting off there uh, when, when people get frustrated. And I think a lot of that, that idea comes out of frustration when you've been wronged. And usually, I mean, rightfully so, you have been wronged, like have, uh, ha- have, have legitimate issues there. Um, but recognizing that we really don't want the wrath of God poured out on anyone, because if it's poured out on anyone, it's going to be poured out on us because we're just as wicked as the person to my left or my right. So what we're going, the structure of revelation six is that as each one of these seals is open, it unleashes a rider. So what we're going to do is read each seal being open and then kind of talk about it and kind of work our way through the book that way. The seventh seal being open unleashes the seven trumpets, which when they're blown, unleashes the seven bowls and kind of continuation. So we, today we're going to see six of the seven seals popped open. So, so we start out, John writes, now I watch when the lamb opened one of the seven seals and I heard one of the four living creatures. Now remember there were four living creatures and they were standing around. They were saying, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was, who is, who is to come. So now one of them pauses in that song and it, the, the, uh, one of the four living creatures say with a voice like thunder, come and I look and behold. And before we go any deeper, I, we're going to read the word behold a lot. And to me, I think kind of that marbleized term behold takes away some of the unction, the seriousness that John is. He's saying, look, ah, oh my gosh. <laughs> it, it would be like if, what do you call it on a horror movie when the person, it's um, a scare snap or like a shriek. No, no, like when, when you, you know, in, in a horror movie when the guy's looking in the mirror and then all of a sudden something jumps up behind him. No, no, I'm not a big scary movie person. Okay, so in a scary movies, there's always those things where it's like the, the director is trying to get you to pay attention. And so the, the music will be minor key and, and that <laughs> kind of zooms in. And you know, you know, you start stealing yourself for something's about to happen here. Yeah. That's what John is doing when he says, behold, he's saying, look, oh my gosh, look at this. And so... Come and I looked and behold, a white horse and its rider had a bow and a crown was given to him and he came out conquering and to conquer. Now on each one of these seals, we're going to see that each seal leads to the next seal. Yeah. And so um, we have a, I, I, I don't like to go, um, I don't like to play like I'm some kind of Greek uh, master or anything because I'm not, but just the words don't give us all the connotation. So the... Um, the first rider is on a white horse, and he has a bow and a crown. Now, the first thing we notice is the bow doesn't have any arrows. Yeah. So he's coming threatening war, but there's no teeth to his threat. Well, and I always, I always thought that this was, and again, in doing this study, I saw of, because every, because I asked, in one of the studies I looked at, it's like, okay, if you're teaching this to students, one of the first things they're going to look at is when you hear white horse, what are you thinking of? Oh, well, this is, this is, this is Jesus coming back. And it's like, hold on. Let's look at these other things, such as the bow, the things that, that this person has. It's not. And that was something that was like really hard. I was like, well, you hear Jesus coming on a white horse. Well, yes, but not, not, not like this. This one isn't it. Uh, and, and so talking through that, and one of the things was Jesus is not coming with a bow. Like that's something you, you've never heard of Jesus with a, a bow. And so they're like, well, so, and that was going to be one of the questions was like, well, what is, if he ever came with a bow, then why does this person have a bow? And so I was looking at, well, some of the other things that I'd gone back to is like, well, like Nimrod, like when he starts Babylon, like that's, he was a bowsman, a huntsman and stuff like that. And so then you see Babylon reference a lot in the rest of Revelation. Uh, and so just kind of making those, again, and I've talked this all throughout when we've done this, of making the connections of this whole thread line, like this was how everything in scripture, all of these things are, there's some, there's some things being tied together here in the end uh, of seeing of when that first not the first, but that first people group de facto we've talked about uh, leaders rising up. One of the first ones that we see recorded uh, of trying to, again, trying to attain God is Nimrod and all his, again, which I, I, until probably about, I don't know, maybe four or five years ago is where I really got the name of like when people would call me a Nimrod. It's like, oh, all righty then. Like, because I, that was like something <laughs> my granddad would say. He's like, man, he's a Nimrod. I was like, well, what is that? I just thought that'd be like I was being goofy or stupid or something, which I mean, I guess 
I mean, it makes sense. I mean, I'm not trying, I was, I don't know if I was trying to attain God, but I guess I was being kind of Nimrodish. Uh, but seeing that played out of, of, of that being the person that we see on this white horse, kind of seeing that reference to someone who is trying to play God. And so here, here this rider comes with a bow without arrows. And so the, the picture that is painted is nation rising against nation, but not in conflict. So there, I mean, not an open, uh, aggressive, people getting killed kind of conflict. It's just nation fussing with each other. Think in your mind, Europe, 1938, mm -hmm. kind of a scenario. Everybody's fussing and fighting, Europe, 1914. Um, Everybody's arguing. The floor of the UN people are stomping shoes. Uh, <laughs> craziness is going on. So here comes this white rider. He's got a bow. He's got a crown. And the crown, the, the Greek word that's used for crown, is not saying that he has authority. It's a laurel crown, which is the prize that's given to somebody who wins a race. And so it's not saying that he's coming like a king. This white rider is coming... Um, with speed and with swiftness and moving across the earth. So all of a sudden, everybody's angry with everybody. Everybody, there's political unrest throughout the world because of this rider. That's what happened. And the rider had a bow, a crown was given to him, and he came out conquering and to conquer. So we see military leaders, we see political leaders without open conflict uh, developing alliances. There's, there's, okay, this almost kind of like what we remember from the cold war. Yeah. All the nations kind of align. Uh, there's some who's going to go on this side, some who are going on that side. The scene is being set for conflict. So the second seal is open and I heard the second living creature say, come and out came another horse, bright red. Its rider was, pr uh, permitted to take peace from the earth so that men should slay one another and he was given a great sword. So now we've gone from political unrest and people's fingers on the trigger, if you will, to open conflict. Yeah. Which, duh. I mean, you, you, when there's, there's border skirmishes, there's people getting angry, there's people with their finger on the trigger, um, the solution to every hammer is Everything looks like a nail if you're a hammer. Well, if you get people, you get a whole bunch of people in a room with differing opinions, things are probably going to get heated. So, um, for, for the first thing that we see in this is bright red, the color of blood, the color of fire. It's getting real. Yeah. First writer comes, everybody's upset. There's, it's, it's kind of the normal political yay yeah yang going on. Now, all of a sudden, we have open conflict, um, the color of fire and blood. The other thing that we can't walk past without noting is the word permitted. Throughout the opening of these seals, one of the things where we can find joy is that these writers only do what the Lamb allows them to do. Well, and all, it never says in any of this, as the scene we just left in chapter 5 was God on the throne and the Lamb taking the seal. You ne that doesn't stop happening as we wrote as, as we move into chapter six. Like you still think of during all of this, God is still on the throne. The Lamb still has the seal, and like you said, all this is being permitted because of what's 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 being allowed for them to do by the by God and by the Lamb who holds the scroll still. So now we've gone from from political unrest to the conflict widening, war becoming normative. Everybody's killing everybody, and um, all the nations of the earth mobilize to destroy each other. And I think about um, during World War II, uh, in 1938, an American would have been hard-pressed to find Palua, Okinawa, um, Normandy on a map. And then all of a sudden, we as a nation, everybody knew where those places were because uh, mankind has an innate ability to, to go to crazy places to kill each other. Well, and this is one of the things I was looking in studying this was the the word that it, it kind of I'm looking at grips me when I hear it, and looking at the color red. It just says that whatever whatever is happening here, it just represents the carnage that will be here uh, during during that than what's going down uh, of, of this horse, of this horseman. Uh, and so just to hear that word carnage of the things that are going to be played out, of the things that are going to go down, of, of bloodshed and fire and destruction and things like that, is just, it's just not a pretty scene. Not a pretty scene at all. Um, so we move from seal one is nation fussing with each other. Seal two is open conflict. So we now get to the third seal. And when he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, come. And I looked and behold, 
a black horse, and its rider had a pair of scales in his hand, and I heard what seemed to be the voice in the midst of the four liters, the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and wine. As is a natural progression after war becomes economic turmoil. Scarcity. So one of the weird things about our society that I, I didn't realize was weird until I lived in other cultures, um, right now, if if we're sitting in the sanctuary on October 5th, if I want a watermelon, I can go get me a watermelon. Yeah. Uh, they, they'll have them at Johnson's. It's no big deal. I can go get a pomegranate. I can go get a banana. I can go get grapes. Whatever season it's supposed to be, I can go. I can go get that. It doesn't matter in the United States because we have a, a shipping infrastructure where if an apple is grown in Chile, they can ship it to Miami, truck it from Miami to to Johnson's grocery store down the street, and I can go get it. All of those shipping lanes all of a sudden become places of conflict, and so now you have people who who cannot eat. I um, went to Haiti right after the earthquake uh, that occurred in what two thousand. Six ish. Yeah, something like that, yeah. Um, so on on one day, everything's normal. You've got a, a modern city in Port au Prince that had malls and grocery stores and it would have been primitive by our standards, but nonetheless you could you could eat, no, no problem. This earthquake occurs and within forty eight hours you literally had people killing each other over food. Mm-hmm. Scarcity of food has a tendency to shift everything because a hungry man doesn't know anything except he wants something to eat. Yeah. And so now because of the the prices that are given are make it about eight times the normal amount. So flour is really expensive. It, flour is what you make bread with. That's what you, you have your for your normal staple. Barley, which we would think of as uh, feed, uh, it's not something that normally we eat that much unless you're trying to do some kind of high fiber weirdo diet. Yeah. Is a little bit cheaper because it's not something that humans normally consume a lot of. Well, and uh, I had read that like the amounts that are given here of the barley and the wheat are like daily portions per se. Yes. And if that goes like, so it's like what it costs you to eat daily or for your family daily is now like what, eight times as much as it would have been before, which is crazy. Right. So if you, you to feed your family normally is, you know, 40 bucks. Um, you're looking at three hundred and twenty dollars. Golly, so um, I'm so broke. I'm broke now, but I'm I will be, I'm I would be so broke, so broke. It'd be so bad. That's why you need to grow a garden, brother. Yes, yeah. <laughs> so um, we, we have this scarcity of food, and yet we still see the lamb is in control because he cl- says, "I don't touch the oil and the wine." <laughs> And some commentators really g- jump off on this uh, with the oil and the wine. Um, th- they try to say that it doesn't affect rich people. Uh, I-, I don't see that because I use oil. You, you literally got some from the mailman today. Yes. Like, you, you got a whole like liter, gal- like a liter bottle of, of like avocado oil in there in the office right well, now. Well, you know, I'm, I, I'm reading this. I'm going, well, you know what? I got to stock up. <laughs> I don't plan on being here for this. <laughs> So black uh, is in Lamentations chapter 5, verse 10, it says this. It says, our skin is as hot as an oven with the burning heat of famine. That is an unbelievably negative picture. Well, and like you said, uh, essentially when you go without food and go without the, the nutrients and the nutrition that your body needs, every other, every, other, every other thing that would have been on your mind, that would have been something, you, I mean, you go, you go backwards in terms of, your, of thinking almost... No, I don't want to say like a, I don't want to say like we're animals, but like our 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 first need, our first our our first necessity is food and nutrition and water, and so like when that's not met, things start breaking down pretty quickly. Yes, yes. There's uh, was it Maslow's hierarchy of needs? Yeah. That if the top needs, which are air, if you don't have oxygen. You're not thinking about anything lower right. down the list. You're right. not going, hey, you know, I could I could sure use a nutty buddy right now. No, you're only thinking, got to breathe. Yeah, hey, you know what? I could use, how about a good book? Like, no. <laughs> so as you work down that list, if any of the, the things above the list, so the first need is oxygen and then shelter and food, water, or water food. If those needs aren't being met, then you're not thinking about anything else. And so when food becomes scarce, uh, you're not really concerning yourself with, 
uh, you know, I, I think we're going to remodel the kitchen. Well, and it's going to feed more and more into the chaos and the destruction. And again, the carnage that you're seeing played out in the horsemen before it just, they all, they all just feed on top of each other. I, uh, like I said, I was in, in, uh, Haiti right after the earthquake and I ended up, I, I went for one group to, to kind of do a site survey, but because there was so much destruction, I, I didn't really get an opportunity to do that. Uh, I ended up working with doctors without borders and I just kind of functioned as a chaplain. Mm-hmm. Uh, they taught me how to, to start an IV because no matter how you're triaging people who they're finding in the rubble, um, you, almost always you have to start an IV because right. they've been dehydrated because they've been trapped under a building. For right, days. right. And so I, I, I got actually pretty proficient at, at uh, starting an IV, but there was a group of doctors from uh, Chicago that was there when I first got there. And then they, they were there for a certain number of days and then they rotated off, went home. And there was a group of doctors coming from Madrid. And so there was like a, this two hour window when um, there, there were no doctors. I was the only person in the facility that we, we, we had. And so the police guys can't come running in and grabbing what we were using as a gurney. And, and I, I'm trying to tell them in my, my best Creole, which is none, um, <laughs> hey, there's, there's no doctors here, so don't go get anybody. And they kept saying, well, it, it, it's, it's an emergency. He's hurt. And I'm like, it doesn't matter because I can't do anything. But they didn't listen to me. They run out and they come back with this guy who um, had literally gotten into a fight over some rocks rice, just rice. And someone had cut him open and his entrails had spilled out. So they bring this guy in. He's literally holding his guts. And so all I knew how to do was start an IV. So I started an IV and uh, I prayed for him, which I was able to do that. And two, two out of two. So <laughs> what, I, what I know to do, what I know to do, I did. I did, I did the things that I knew to do. And then, um, we where we were we had dealt a lot with uh, ladies giving birth because mm-hmm. when there's super traumatic events like that if you're you know seven months or better your 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 body's going to go all right well let's get this kid out yeah and so we had these huge pads that they used for for birth giving and so I just literally duct taped this guy with those pads and I, when I say duct tape I'm I literally mean gray the your standard duct tape. Uh, so I wrapped this guy up in the pads, duct taped him up, and then asked the police to carry him the two miles to the hospital. Uh, I got to go visit him a few days later. He lived. So wow. I, I didn't mess up too terribly bad. Oof. My point is, though, is here he had gotten into a fight with someone, and this is 72 hours after the earthquake, to the point that under normal normal circumstances, he would have been killed over a cup of rice, mm. which is those of you that have eaten just boiled rice, not the tastiest food. Yeah, I don't. I mean, I'm not a big fan of rice. So I, I'm. I think that under normal circumstances, no one would kill somebody else over some rice. No. You know what? I will take you out over this cup of rice. But when you don't have food, your family doesn't have food. Things get things get hairy. Things get hairy, and that's exactly what we're seeing here. But uh, the the lamb and the God sitting on the throne are still in control because somehow in the way that all of this plays out, oil and wine aren't affected. So you can go get your bottle of Chablis uh, or you can get you some some uh, um, extra virgin olive oil and the prices aren't affected. And, you know, we, we actually saw, I thought it was interesting during the whole you know, May or March, people gutting each other over toilet paper. Yeah, toilet paper and Lysol wipes. But you could get all the paper towels you needed. Yeah. I mean, it, it was it, it, that sort of thing normally happens when distribution networks are 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 messed up. That there are some things that are gra- vastly affected, and some things that they just aren't. I've never understood, and this is not super relevant, but it's just like the kind of the whole like what you go grab off the store is like when. When James Spann or whoever says, hey, it's going to get a little cold in the next few days or it's, you know, some things might happen. You know, if any, if any weather in Alabama or wherever gets any just disrupted just a tad, there is no milk and no bread. And I don't really understand <laughs> why. Like, how many people are eating br- uh, milk sandwiches? Like, what? It, like, I don't. I've never understood that. I, I, I don't know. Maybe yeah, it, milk and bread is a weird thing. You would think like lunch meat, like, like gallons of water, like that. Like, like I mean, that makes a little sense. Lunch meat like, makes it maybe some maybe some cheese. If you're a cheese guy, I'm a cheese person. Milk and bread. I, I don't. I don't. I mean, how much how, how much cereal can you eat? Well, and may, maybe it's that everybody's making French toast. 
I, I feel like that's not it because there's plenty of butter everywhere. <laughs> yeah, butter and eggs. I mean, I, I don't know. I, I've, I've kind of wondered that myself. And, and you know what? There's quite a few comedians who have done skits. On. Oh, 100%. 100%. <laughs> like, that's my favorite thing is, well, outside of, you know, the storms and stuff are bad. But, like, you just see the shelves at Walmart are just, like, disheveled. Like, I mean, again, we talked about the other day about Jeff Overstreet, the bread man. Like, he stays in business whenever James Mann says something like that. Like, he is pumping the bread loaves out like nobody's business. The um, I, I did see J J James Mann, our local weather guy, actually has a pretty good attitude about it. I saw a uh, commercial for something where he's he finds out that there's an ice storm coming and before he gets on the tv he get he gets on the phone he's like yeah sell everything and buy milk and bread <laughs> <laughs> that's good that's good all right so um the lamb is still in control and then now we move to the fourth seal so the fourth seal uh it says when he opened the fourth seal i heard the voice of the fourth living creature say come and i looked and behold a pale horse and its rider's name was death and hades followed him and they were given a authority over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword and with famine and with pestilence and by a wild beast of the earth. So we're, we're going to have to spend a little time here because first of all, the pale, uh, we, I think when I hear pale, I think like, you know, one of those colors that women make up taupe. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but this is a sickly gray green. Yeah. That's what, that's what I had read in like this Greek in the, in the Greek, uh, the word that's used here. It's like, again, it, the best reference was like that that color that most people get right before you throw up, the light, greenish, terrible looking color that just makes you get, you know, clammy and pukey, that's the color that you see here. And so it, it is the, the the color that a corpse turns yeah. after it's laid there for a little while. Um, and so the death here is coming and we see epidemic disease breaking out. Which, again, this is the natural flow of things. Seal one, everybody's in, in an uproar. Seal two, open conflict. Seal three, because of the conflict, distribution processes are, dis, dis, are disrupted. We have famine. We have hunger. We, we, so then that naturally moves to disease, sickness, and death. And we have death in, in a large way. Well, if there's a lot of, again, the carnage and the war and the destruction and then lack of food and those things, all of those things lead to pretty much one, one, one ending point, and, and that's death. And so you see a lot of that happen here when the seal's open. So a quarter of the world's population is killed. So it, it, assuming today's population, a little over 7.7 .7 billion, so a quarter would be around 2 billion people yeah, it's like die. just under 2, pili 2 billion people, which is just absolutely insane. Like, that's an incredible number. Now this is a Thanos snap. This is, I mean, nuts. It's absolutely crazy. So here we have massive death on a massive scale. And uh, the wild beast, I, I, it was really interesting because I was thinking, I thought in my mind when I first read this, I'm picturing, you know, lions and tigers and bears roaming the streets, oh just my. taking people out. Yeah. Um, what do you think would be the deadliest creature on earth? You know, you think sharks, you think hippos. Personally, I am just a big no snake guy. Like, I mean, and I'm not going to say there's a whole lot of theology there, but I think Satan was a snake for a reason, and I'm just <laughs> not a big fan. What is it Rick and Bubba call it? Satan's little hand puppet? Yeah, I'm just <laughs> not a fan. I, I, I mean, I am, a, and I know some snakes do good things. If there's any snakes out there listening, I'm sorry, but if, to me, a good snake is a dead snake, and that's just me. There are good snakes, and, and uh, I try, I try uh, to, if I come across a snake, to uh, not just indiscriminately kill the snake. <laughs> I've, I've been told that, like, King snakes take out venomous snakes yes uh I, were, I was the pastor of this church for literally a month and we were having a work day uh and called me and said i need you to come home and i'm like well baby i'm i'm, I'm and she, just come home and That's so never i never a good call yeah never Ever. a good call so i get in the car i'm thinking you know somebody's somebody's been hurt so, and so i get there and there is this pine snake that is probably four feet long and it's coiled up in the entryway. It's trapped her in in the kitchen. And she's screaming. She's got, you know, brooms, mops, everything. And and I laugh. I laugh. She's got a mop. She's got it all. <laughs> she she does. She's she's dug firearms out. It's like, <laughs> settle down. It's just a little pine snake. It's not that big a deal. Um, so I'm I'm gonna pick this thing up. And so I get a broom to hold his head down to reach down and pick it up. And when I put the broom there, he strikes the broom like twice. And so I'm like, okay, big boy here's a little agitated. <laughs> he is not okay with what's going on. He is uncomfortable here. So I, I'm thinking to myself, Ann's 
you know, thrown pots at this thing long enough to where he, he's done playing. And so I'm just going to come in from behind him and, and pin his head down and throw him out in the yard. So I, I kind of go outside, go around the house to come in the other door. And when I come in the other door, he rolls over and straightens out and strikes at me from behind. Oh, no. And so I say to myself... You, big boy, have just committed suicide. Yes, sir. Sir, I, th- sir I'll give you two chances. <laughs> At this point, we, we ain't played anymore. You have failed. If I, if I put a hole in the floor, there's a hole in the floor. I know you're a pine snake, but now you're a dead pine snake. <laughs> and so um, I took his head off. Uh, and by this point is at the neighbor's house screaming, <laughs> literally. And the neighbors are all out because here's this woman going around in the neighborhood going, ah. And uh, I walk out and I'm holding the dead snake and he's still coiled up around my arm and coiling and uncoiling without a head. Um, uh, he was just in a foul mood. Just having a bad day. So uh, he had a, it, his day got even worse. Yeah. <laughs> so um, snakes, maybe uh, the deadliest creature on earth is a mosquito. Ah. Uh. Because malaria takes out millions every year. Uh, rats are extremely deadly. If you think of black plague, yeah. you think of, I've read that may, maybe that the lice on the rats uh, isn't what caused that. But rats, regardless, are, are, are little, little pestilence carrying uh, yeah, you creatures. See, you see pestilence. And I, again, not something, the people who have like mice and stuff as pets, I just, and if you do, that's awesome, you know, to each their own. Um, I don't know what it does for you. I really don't. So here we have disease and pestilence is rampant disease that's just killing everybody. I, you know, I, I was reading uh, when the coronas broke out, um, I, I dug deep in my, um, my history books to try to find what the church's response to disease had been in the past. I, I didn't want to try to, to, to recreate the wheel. No, and especially if, it has, if it's already been done and been done well. I remember you talking to me about this when this first started. So I, I found uh, a lot of text on the, the Black Death and the uh, sweating diseases. And there there been various and sundry pestilence that's kind of swept through Europe. Um, and, and the Black Death, it was so bad. It would kill you so quick that literally people would go into someone's home to, to take the corpses out. And they would find where... Uh, some folks had gone in to loot the house, had caught the disease, and died in the house. Oh, my gosh. So they'd broken into this house because, hey, th- these people are dead. We're going to go steal their, their widescreen TV. They get in there to get their stuff, catch the disease, and die in the house. Golly. So this is zombie apocalypse level. Yeah. Yeah. Um, of of catching disease, and so you've got this going on. You've got hunger, and again, all of this kind of naturally flows. Combat's going on everywhere. People are dying. Corpses are being left at places, rotting. You've got creatures care- going around carrying disease from person to person. You've got uh, wild animals that that now are roaming. Dogs are attacking. It's just. This this is um, a, a you know w- whatever movie you want to think of. Again, two billion people die. You said whatever movie you want to think of, and I did not think of a serious movie. I thought of immediately Monty Python, like bring out your dead. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm not dead yet. <laughs> I, yes, could, I, I couldn't help it. I mean, that's like my <laughs> when I go to. <laughs> okay, so uh, for <clears throat> those of you that that's info at North <laughs> Um, okay, so f- after the f- fourth seal, uh, guess what? We go to the fifth seal. Uh, and so um, let me find where we are. The Monty Python has completely thrown me <laughs> I'm off. I'm sorry. Uh, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness that they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete, who were to be killed as they himself had been killed. And so here we see the martyrs under the throne. So this is literally John draws our attention to the witnesses against humanity. It's almost like as we're reading, it's gone from, you know, wars... Uh, countries arguing with each other, I, I, that could be happening today. Yeah. To two billion people dying. It's almost like there needs to be a pause here for, for humanity or anyone reading this to go, 
okay, God, we, we got it. Your vengeance is, hold your wrath back. Oh, Lord, please hold your wrath back. And then John is drawing us to why. And it is that justice is being served. And under the throne of God are millions of souls who have died for no reason other than the fact that they represent Christ. The fact that there's martyrs, Jesus said over and over and over again, should not shock us. Yeah. He said, they hated me, and because they hated me, they hated you. And so our enemy and the world that we live in dislike us because we represent the lamb. Well, and, and it's from a selfish standpoint, like we represent everything. Because, and we've talked, we've talked about these things. Like everything anterior to the gospel is everything that focuses on me in the, in a culture that focuses on me in a culture that, that cultivates everything revolving around me. And as believers, as gospel centric people, it's so antithetical to that. That's like, that's not what it's about. It's constantly dying to self. Something that I, I mean, again, am not, am not great at and, and working on daily as every believer should, but, uh, because, because of that thought, because of how everything again is, is based on the fact culturally that well, it's all about me and my truth and my happiness and all, and, and me finding me, me doing me. Uh, and the gospel says, well, no, it's not. It, it's absolutely not. It's about, it's about a King. It's about a kingdom. It's about a savior who did, who did everything for you. And it, everything that he did for you, you could accomplish never on your own and completely flips that on its script. Uh, and usually that peeves people off like that. When you tell them, Hey, or, or when, even when you just live out, you don't have to say anything. When you just live out stuff that's it's not about you, and sometimes that just for people who are just li- who are doing the wrong and you're living right, sometimes that just pees people off. Like it just makes them mad because um, automatically you just think they're better than you, yada 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 yada, and whatever we think, and it just really, as Jesus said, because because of because of my sake, people will hate you. People will come after you. On a microscopic level. I have been at many the wedding reception, kids party, Halloween party that I can tell that all the men are hanging out somewhere where I'm not. Yeah. <laughs> um, and they're walking around all of a sudden for some reason with Yeti cups. Yeah. That the very presence of a believer is is really um, dampening this party. It's, it's almost it's almost off putting. Like, hey, if you could, if you could go away, you could just like step out for a, a second or two. That could be for the rest of the night. Yeah, if you could, like, we'd, we'd really, we thank you for coming. Yeah. So, uh, thanks for coming, Pastor. We love you. Have a nice day. Yeah. Hint, hint. Wink, wink. <laughs> and so, the, so that's on one tiny, tiny sk- place. And then I. Uh, having lived in a mu- Muslim country, um, new believers who a could not get a job, right? Because on their their ID, instead of saying Musliman, it said Christian. So that that any job that they applied for, once they saw on their ID that they were Christian, they're like, oh, well, uh, I'm sorry, we filled this with somebody else. Even deeper than that, their families literally either had a funeral for them because they weren't going to have anything else to do with them or actively were trying to kill them in an honor killing. Yeah, it's and it's more than just, like, I'd always heard, like, oh, you, you know, in your families, you get ostracized, you get kicked out, and both of those things are not good. But like you just said, it's so much more than being ostracized and kicked out. Like, you have people that you love that you care about that are coming to hunt you down and that's intense and discipled a lady who uh, was Syrian her brother uh, had told her if I ever see you again I'm going to kill you because you've brought shame on this family because you you've become a believer um, there are we literally today live in the age of the martyr in that there are more believers around the world today and I would I would commend Voice of the Martyrs to to you. Um, If you ever feel like you're suffering because you got kicked out of a party, pick up a copy of Fox's Book of Martyr, um, The Martyr's Mirror, or even Jesus Freak, which has taken some of those stories and tried to give them in modern light. Yeah. Uh, Let me just share one from you. I I read the story of a pastor uh, in England in uh, 16th century. His mother was condemned to death uh, because she had taught her children the Ten Commandments and the Lord's Prayer. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the teaching at the time was that um, only 
priests should should have access to the Bible, and so she had had violated that by herself teaching her children that, and so uh, so many believers, as they went to be burned at the stake, had shared their faith, so that the authorities learned to what to do uh, to, was to put a screw in the mouth of the person and screw it into their jaw, so that they could not speak. Uh, this child was forced to watch his mother burned at the stake. Mm. Um, he was then given over to another family who were not believers to raise him, a good family, according to the government and according to the society. Uh, and shockingly, the, uh, God honored the prayers of this lady, and he became a Christian. And he eventually became a pastor. And as he would preach, he kept the screw that was in his mother's mouth in his pocket to remind him to be a voice for her uh, because she had lost her, her life for her faith. Wow. And so those are the, the people who are under the throne demanding justice. How long? They are under the throne today, crying out to the throne. How long until our lives are avenged? And that kind of humbles me because, like, even even in my selfishness, sometimes like, I get very much like like I get like a, a little bit of Jonah syndrome. I'm like, God, you know what? Like, why don't you just take out these people? You know, like I'm, I'm over here doing all the right things, and these people over here doing the wrong things. And why, why are you showing them grace? Like, why? why and I get a little bit of Jonah syndrome in my head because I get a little frustrated, or my feelings get hurt, or I, you know, I'm wearing something on my shoulder a little bit. And and, and so, but then I, but then I read this, and it's like, hey, you know what, big fella, you really don't have it all that bad. You're you're you're, you're fine. You're, you just got your feelings hurt. So, uh, John MacArthur, I, I like the way that he said this. He says. Um, the rest of this, the book, the book of Revelation, shows how God progressively answers the prayers of the martyrs under the throne. Oh, wow. Okay. And so justice, which the most wicked violation of justice is that someone is executed for no reason other than the fact that they represent the God that we hate. And so um, they are given a white robe. And you know, I, most of my life I read white robe and I think in my mind, um, well, that's because they're, they're pure. We, we see that, that the multitude around the throne has white robes that are, are washed in the blood of the lamb. Several commentators have pointed out that the, the white robes of the martyrs represent a lot of things. And obviously purity is one of them, but the other is that they're toils are over. And this is what, what's meant by that. And when, once I read this, it made perfect sense to me. I, I've always been jealous of people who can, can dress fancy. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I used to work for a guy who always looked like he had just put on clothes from the cleaners. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I ain't that guy. Yeah. Uh, I could, could, could put on a white shirt right now and f walk from here to my office and I will look like I painted a barn. Yeah. Well, that's what you said. You said, what do you think of when you think of white robes? And I'm like, I would think of how in the world did the stain get here? Like that's exactly, <laughs> exactly. what I would think of. I'm gonna spill coffee yeah. on it. I'm gonna somebody's gonna have a, a you sharpie. Walk, you walked in the office the other day and we're just talking, and as you're talking, you've spilled like half your cup of coffee out <laughs> on the floor. Yes, <laughs> that's me. Uh, <laughs> So their, their toils are over, victory has been declared, there's no more labor. Mm. And so they can, they can wear, wear white. Their rest from labors are being signified by the fact. Uh, and again, John, who is seeing this, is in the midst of his labors. He is exiled to Patmos. He's living in a cave. He's living under extreme persecution. And so he knows some of these martyrs who's under the throne and under the throne is signifying of the fact that they have the ultimate protection. Yeah, and that's what something I thought was their positioning of being under the throne. Like I always, I thought that that was really vivid and very uh, was just it was very cap it was just very captivating of uh, of the position that they're in. They are given special a uh, special place of honor, a special place of protection. It's kind of like if you've ever been to somebody's, and I'm not comparing these people to a yippy dog, but if you've ever been to somebody's house who has like a chihuahua, yeah. and that chihuahua will come bark, 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 bark at you, and then go get underneath yep. their master yes. to, to show that, okay, I know that I'm not the big dog that I'm acting like, and so I need somebody to protect me. Mm -hmm. 
the ultimate protection for the souls of the martyr is the throne of God mm -hmm. is over them. Nothing is going to hurt them, bother them, mess with them anymore. They're, the ultimate big brother is saying, I got you. Yeah. They're, so they're in a place of protection. They're in a place where their clothing, everything about them is signifying you are done from your labors. Your work has been honored. You are blessed. You are set aside by God. So then he opens the sixth seal. So when he opened the sixth seal, I looked and behold, there was a great earthquake and the sun became black as sackcloth. The full moon became like blood. The stars of the sky fell to the earth. The fig tree shed its winter fruit when shaken by a gale. The sky vanished like a scroll that is being rolled up. Every mountain and island was removed from place. The kings of the earth and the great ones and the generals and the rich and powerful and everyone slave and free hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks and mountains, calling to the mountains and rocks, following us to hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of their wrath has come who can stand. God's wrath is poured out ultimately. Now, this is where we get to that. We're going to see visions in the future, vision. Yeah. This sixth seal being open is going to be something that we're going to see again. We're going to come back here, but this is the day of the Lord. Yeah. The sixth seal is associated with force, and the force is fear. Mankind wants to die. Yeah, we, we, you, see, you see hiding, you see running away, you see all these things of, ju of just trying to run away from the grip and the impact that this day brings. I, let me quote from MacArthur's commentary here because, again, I, I love the way he puts it. Like the first five seals, the sixth seal is associated with a force, and the force here is fear. A feeling which is among the most powerful of human emotions, capable of seizing control of mind and will. Fear can produce everything from cowards to heroism, strength to weakness, aggression to passivity, reason to confusion, clear thinking to total panic. Fear can strengthen the heart and make it beat faster or stop it dead. This uh, fear is the most powerful force in humanity. What is it? Um, that uh, Churchill said, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. Yeah. And he didn't say that uh, while walking the beach. He said that while German bombs were falling. Yeah. And he, he was absolutely correct. Fear is the mind killer, to quote Dune. Um, fear is an unbelievable, I can think of multiple times in my life when fear almost caused humongous problems and issues when there was really nothing to fear. Uh, I gave the example when I, I preached on this of I was here at the church one night in the middle of the night and the alarm system was telling me that there was someone in the building. I'm walking around the building checking different pads. And so whoever was in the building uh, was moving as well. It freaked me out. And I'm, I'm, I'm I literally, you know, my watch is saying good workout. Um, and come to find out it was just the janitor who had headphones on, who yeah. had no idea that I was in the building as well. And when we finally ran into each other, it was like this progressive, ah, for a good solid minute because we both shocked each other at one o'clock in the morning <laughs> and there was nothing wrong, but that fear was very real. Well, and kind of like we talked about with some of the, um, hunger stuff and some of those things drive you to certain points because other things are being filled like the way that fear works it, everything else in your mind is captivated and taken aback by this immediate danger that you feel like that like you get that you get that it's a weird mix of of nerves and jitteriness uh it's not it's not excitement but it, it's this weird mix of nerves and jitteriness and then just oh my gosh like this is the end i'm gonna die this is how it happens uh and it's it's things like that. And any time for me, if you just mix any kind of any just things up in the air, mix in the dark, I'm just not a fan. I never have been. I just I don't I don't love it. Uh, the, I, the the flashlight on the iPhone has been one of my best friends because like I'll just hear Winston ruffling in my house, and it's like I just get a little I just like get a little nervous and just turn the light on. So here we see kings, leaders, generals, everybody in control in absolute panic which implies that everybody else is in absolute panic. And we see the natural order of things, the sky being rolled up, the sun turning to, I mean, the moon turning to blood, the sky being darkened. So I think 
it, I, I'm preaching through uh, Luke 21, which is Jesus talking about this very same time. And he talks about the temple being destroyed um, and how the things that we that give us stability, the, the physical structures that they're always there. You know, the courthouse is just one of the, it's been there for 100 years. It's always going to be there kind of a thing. Yeah, you mean it's like the memorial and stuff yesterday. Uh, like the Lincoln Memorial and things of that nature that you always just see as these huge, massive pieces of architecture that will crumble. And so beyond that, the natural order of things, sky, stars, sun, moon, those being different instills an almost immediate panic. Well, and when those things become different, guess what? Everything else in, in, in its natural place and order has now shifted and is now different. And, and human beings do not do well with change. I remember a few years ago, you know, we had the big uh, um, eclipse. And I, I know that uh, William and I were a bunch of, of the football players were out standing in the parking lot with, uh, oh, with welding masks and all this kind of stuff. And then I got a phone call where uh, somebody that was a member of the church was broken down. And so William and I hopped in the truck. We went somewhere uh, and then came back. And as we turned around to come back, it just hit me that the light was different. And it was my first physical sensation of what what is going on was fear. It, it's like something's wrong. It, it, there was still light. It wasn't a full eclipse. It wasn't like it had gotten dark all of a sudden, but something was wrong. Yeah, well, I, I remember, and it, it's, not the, it's not the same thing, but uh, a few weeks ago in, like, in San Francisco, I remember seeing a picture of the Giants on, on, at San Francisco Park taking batting practice with the fire and stuff, like going around in the background and how it was just creepy. Like it was 5 o'clock, like it's sunset time, and then because of all the fire and, the, and, and so things are different colors, like there's light, but it was weird. It was apocalyptic and weird. It was not natural. And so all of the natural order being disrupted causes people to panic, people to literally cry out for death. They're suicidal. In Matthew 24, Jesus described the same event saying, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its lights, and the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven will be shaken. Um, nothing Nothing outside of our God is stable. And so if we could leave you at the end of Revelation 6 with anything, take heart in the fact that remember what the, the four creatures said around the throne. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was, who is, who is to come. Place your faith, your trust, your hope in him. Though heaven and earth pass away, his words will not pass away. He is stable. Well, because what's going on here in, in all this, in, in some of these seals being broken open, in the craziness, the chaos, the carnage, the scarcity, the famine, the death, the cosmic chaos that is going on, never do we see a time where God is not on the throne, where the Lamb does not have the scroll. And then in our life right now, never do we see a time where God is not on the throne, where God is not orchestrating the way things that he wants them to go, the way that he, that he says they're going to go. That's some, one of the toughest realities is if, things want, if, if God wanted things different, guess what? They would be. And that's tough for me. Sometimes that's tough for me to chew and swallow and understand, uh, but something that I need to find also, I need to be assured by and also find rest in that if my life or whatever situation I'm going through, if, I, if, I, if God wanted that to be different, it would be. I wouldn't be here unless God wanted me here. Uh, and, and so in this, in this, in, in these seals being broken open, to know that God is on the throne the whole time, that Jesus holds the scroll to the title of the earth, like that, that, that this is going exactly the way that God had planned from the beginning of time for it to go, is assuring and something that we can find rest in. Amen. Amen. Well, on that note, we will next week pick up with Revelation chapter 7. Uh, look forward to you joining us with uh, Not Another Revelation podcast. Thank you guys again for joining us on this week's episode of Not Another Revelation Podcast. You can join us live in person each Sunday at North Linko Baptist Church at 10 a.m. Or you can go to our website, northlinko.org, to watch our live stream or check out our other podcasts, ministry information, past sermons, and past worship service. Thank you guys for tuning in. 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 For tuning in.